This is February 27th, 2019. We are in Bedford, Massachusetts at the Edith Norris Rogers Memorial Veterans Hospital. And this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Jim Ramsey, <clears throat> and our camera person is Maureen Sullivan. We're very privileged to have with us today Kevin Barry Strell. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for being with us. May I ask when you were born? July 4th, 1950. Independence Day, 1950? Yes. Great. And where were you born? New York City. Did you grow up in New York City? Uh, pretty much. I had a chaotic upbringing, so I was in New York City until I joined the Army. Okay, okay. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have one brother and three half-sisters. Three half-sisters. And you grew up uh, in the city, uh, kind of in the, what, what was the neighborhood or the area of New York City where you? Uh, I grew up in Spanish Harlem. Spanish Harlem, okay. Yeah, until, uh, like I say, my, until I was seven, and then I went to live with my grandmother. When you, when you were seven? Yeah. Oh, and, your grandmother, uh, I see. Uh, <clears throat> and she lived in Spanish Harlem? No. Okay. She lived in the uh, on 30th Street on the east side, and uh, but I started having problems in school and everything else. So uh, when I was 14, I 15, I take that back. 15 years old, I ended up in a halfway house for juvenile delinquents. You did? Okay. In Hell's Kitchen, New York. In Hell's Kitchen? Yeah. And that's, is that, is that in southern Manhattan or? <clears throat> yeah, that's on the lower west side. Lower west side? Yeah. If I may ask, how long were you in the halfway house? Until I was 17 years old when I joined the Army. Wow. So you went right into the army from the halfway house. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, uh, what is your marital status uh, now? Are, are um, you married? I'm happily married. Good for you. That's great. And do you have children? I have two sons that don't know me. I see. But you also, you but also have, have stepchildren? But I have uh, five stepchildren. Five stepchildren? Yeah. Who, uh, who do know you? Yeah. And the four, the oldest one lives in Uruguay, but the, uh, the four, uh, three, three boys and two girls that lives with their mother when I met her. Uh, they just gravitated toward me and they love me and uh, you said uh, Uruguay is that where your wife is that's is she where from she's, that's where she's from initially hmm. yeah but now she lives around here or close by here in Leominster Mass Leominster okay 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 and do you have any grandchildren I have one grandson Right. Oh, I think you t uh, just recently born, right? Yeah, uh, probably about six months ago. Not, no, not even that long. Maybe about uh, four months ago. And is the grandchild in Le Leminster? Uh, he lives in Fitchburg. Good. So he comes to see you from mm, time to time? No, no. I think his parents are afraid to bring him to a hospital right I, now. Okay. Okay. Sure. Well, one day. Yeah. And where did you live before coming here to the VA hospital? I lived at home with my wife in Leominster. Leominster? Yeah. And how long have you lived in Leominster? Uh, basically since I got the Army in 1970. So Leominster, long time home. Yeah. Yeah. 
Mass. Mm -hmm. So you grew up in New York, you went in the Army, and then you came back and lived in Massachusetts. Yeah, I, when I got out of the Army, I just fell in love with the area. And, you know, if you grow up in the uh, asphalt jungle, mm. and you come <laughs> to Lemonster, you know, this is the country. And people say, this isn't the country. But to me... Compared to New York City, just about anything, I guess, will be the country. It right? is, yes. Good, good. That's great. That's great. Okay, well, well, we'll talk a little bit about, in fact, we'll talk a lot, hopefully, about your time in the military. Um, where and when did you enter the military? Uh, because I was only 17, I had to have my mother sign for me. Uh, that was in New York City, August 1967. August 1967? Yeah. And you were then, you were just 17? I was 17 years old. Wow. And did you, this was a voluntary, voluntary thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was during the draft, but I, you know, I, uh, I why, volunteered. Why, why did you decide to volunteer? Uh, if I, if you, if, if I may ask. Well, living in a halfway house, and I really didn't see what I was going to do when I turned 18 and where I, where I was going to go. And uh, my family, uh, my grandfather fought in both World War I and World War II in the Army. Uh, my uncle fought in Korea in the Air Force. I had another uncle who is retired from the Air Force. Uh, so. So you had a history of military service in your yeah. family? Duty, duty on our country, yeah. Duty on our country. And so I decided to join the Army. Good for you. Good for you. So, um, and you joined the Army. And you, uh, why did you choose the Army, by the way? Why not the Air Force, for instance, or the Navy? Uh, it just seemed natural to me. Good, good, that's, that's great. And uh, where, where did you enlist? In New York City. In the city? Yeah. Okay. Did any family or friends uh, Sign up at the time that you kind of no. Went in? I, that was 1917, 1967, and uh, people weren't enlisting. Yeah, what was it like at the? T I mean, uh, of course, you were in a special situation in this yeah, halfway house. But I mean, uh, people were during, burning their draft cards and uh, you know going to Canada and everything else. So I really didn't. None of my friends enlisted. Really? Yeah. They were either drafted or somehow got yeah. out of it. Yeah. But you, you gravitated towards it. Yeah. Where were you sent for basic training? Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Fort Bragg. What was basic training like for you? I didn't know what to expect, but I embraced it. It was the structure. Uh, I never had any of that growing up. Uh, give, be given a task to do, and then, you know, okay, this is right, this is wrong, you know. You know, this is how you do it. Uh, and I just embraced it, you know. Even though you really hadn't had any structure. Yeah, exactly. It's, that's actually interesting, because I guess it could have gone either way. But you welcomed the structure. Yeah, I did. Which was a good thing. Otherwise, that would have been a tough, would have been a tougher time. Yeah. That's great. Was there? Well, what about the physical aspects of basic training? It was was that a, it was a big a challenge? Or it was a, it was a little bit difficult for me because I was very thin when I enlisted. I was like 110 pounds. Oh. Uh, but 
I uh, did all the tasks that was required of me, you know. And so uh, you, you met all the challenges. I met all the challenges. Yeah. The obstacle courses and all of that. Uh -huh. I, I assume that was part of it. Yeah, and I did all of that. That's great. So you basically liked it. Was there anything about I, it that you didn't like? Basic, that is? I can't recall anything I didn't like. That's no. great. That's great. That's great. So once, uh, so how long was basic training? I believe it was eight weeks. And did you? Or eight or six. I, you know, we're talking 1967. This it's is a late. while ago. Uh, yeah. 52 so, uh, years. Yeah. So, um, and my memory isn't what it used to be. It was either six or eight weeks. That's yeah. fine. So, did you receive any additional training or specialized training as a result of uh, following that? Yeah. Uh, after basic, I went to Port Sam Houston in Texas, and uh, where I went through um, medic training. Medic? Yeah. How did you uh, come to that? Well, but when I enlisted, I went for a battery, a test. And At enlistment? Yeah. And that was one of the fields that I was qualified for, and that's what I chose. So right at the enlistment, yeah. you, they, you, you were kind of singled out as, yeah, a, I, as a I candidate. Yeah, and I chose that. And you uh, wanted that? Yeah. Had you had any um, nope. medical, um, it doesn't sound like you would have growing nope. up. No, because I dropped out of high school in the 10th grade, so no, I didn't have anything. <laughs> yeah. And when I was working, when I was in the halfway house, I got a job as a mail clerk, so no. Right. But it sounded good to you. Yeah. Well, it's, it, it's great work. Uh, and I know you'll tell us about it in a couple of minutes. Um, so, so basically, for the rest of your military career, you were a medic? Yes. I see. If you how long were you? If you don't mind. No, 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 no. Please, help, help yourself. And how long was that school about? The same kind of length or a little longer? Yeah, no, about... Uh, I'm trying to remember, and I really can't. That's Maybe okay. Maybe about six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. Yeah. But basically, you went in, and did you say in August of 67? Yeah. So basically, it was pretty much. And I finished AIT in uh, December. AI, AIT? Advanced, Indiv Advanced Individual Training. Training, with yeah. a medic training. Yeah. And so I basically, in 60. In December 67, I. Or the end of November, you know, I finished it. Right. And then I got leave, you know, before I shipped out. Maybe you could tell us a little bit before we get into your duty assignments. What does a medic do? Uh, it depends on his assignment. Uh, you can work in the hospital as an aide taking care of patients. Uh, you could be a field medic. And what does a field medic do? Uh, Is that like a combat medic? Yeah, combat medic. Uh, or you could just be stationed with a company, assigned as a medic, taking care of patients if they get hurt. You know, members of your company if they get hurt or something like that. Uh, and. Uh, a medic is different, is not a nurse. No. Not a doctor. No. But actively involved in medical treatment s somehow. On the spot medical treatment. On the spot medical treatment. Yeah. Okay. So after your training, which was really towards the end of 67, you went to your first duty station. Yeah, I had uh, 
30 days leave and then uh, uh, well, when we finished our training, we were standing around and they were calling out our orders and where was the height of the Vietnam War in 67. We were expecting, being medics, we were expecting most of us to get orders for Korea. I mean for Vietnam. To go to Vietnam. Uh, but about 40% of us got orders for Korea. Hmm. And uh, I said, wow, I wonder why. And then when I was home on leave, I picked up the paper one day and I saw that the USS Pueblo had been captured by the North Koreans and its crew was being held captive. I said, wow. So when I landed there, that's what I was walking into. Uh, so tensions were uh, very it, high. Extremely high. And when I got there, I found out there had been assassination attempts on the president of South Korea. <clears throat> uh, they weren't letting anybody who was due to come home. They weren't letting them come home. Uh, they were trying to build up the, the troop strength. The U.S. troop strength. Yeah. And uh, uh, it was, I guess the term you use nowadays is infiltrators coming off the border, coming across the border and uh, causing problems. Uh, the, the North Koreans? Yeah. Were, were, were coming into or making incursions? Yeah. And uh, so uh, I ended up being assigned to the 2nd Division, and then when I got to Division Headquarters, I ended up being assigned to 1st Battalion and 9th Infantry Regiment. 1st Battalion, 9th Infantry Regiment, 2nd Division. Yeah. And uh, uh, and again, this is a complete change for me from, you know, from basic and AIT and now into this. Uh, and uh, So was this a combat situation? Yeah, I ended up being assigned to headquarters unit and I was assigned to the recon platoon. A recon platoon? And yeah, that we patrolled the DMZ. So this platoon had responsibility for patrolling the T DMZ. Yeah. And what were you patrolling for? Or what were you looking for? Insurgents. Insurgent from North Korea. Yeah. So here we are. Uh, this was uh, 16 uh, years after early, the early 1968, about January 1968. Is when I got there, and I was still 17. So the Korean War ended in 1954, but actually it didn't but, end. But it didn't it end. It didn't end. Because there was no truth signed. And in fact, it still it, hasn't it, been signed. No, it has, still hasn't. That's what Trump and huh. Kim are over there saying about, well, maybe this will be signed now, and yada, 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 yada. I believe it when I see it. But anyway, if truce hadn't been declared, and so, I mean, this was, I mean, it, it was war. But yeah. it wasn't really, I mean, well. Yeah, the person. I mean, I mean it was war for sure, yeah, but it the wasn't. The Kim that's causing problems there now, I was fighting against his father. Kim Il-sung? And, Il and his, his father Kim. was the one that started the uh, Korean War. Right. So there's a legacy there for them. Right. So anyway, it was hot, as in combat hot. And so the insurgents would come over. Well, it, it, no, it wasn't say it would be hot, combat hot, but uh, you'd go days, weeks, 
a month and nothing would happen and then all of a sudden something would happen, you know. Uh, it was crazy like that. And typically this, what would happen is the insurgents would come over and what, what were the insurgents trying to do? Kind of re wreak havoc on the, on the allied forces? Yeah, and what they would do is a little APCs anti-personnel mines from the Korean War were still buried along the DMZ and what they would do is they'd come over and they'd dig them up and in the rainy season they'd throw them in rice paddies and in potholes and uh, this is what the insurgents would do? Yeah. And in my platoon, there's three squads, and one squad would be on patrol. One squad would be on strike force, which means if that recon patrol got in trouble, the strike force would go out after them to help and support them. And one squad would have three days off. Oh, to kind of recuperate, yeah. right? right? And uh, it was my turn to have three days off. And a good friend of mine, we went through medic school together, we got shipped over together, and we ended up in the same platoon together. Hmm. And it was his turn to go on patrol. His lieutenant stepped on a landmine, blew his... His lieutenant? His lieutenant. Was that the platoon commander? Yeah. And blew his foot off. And my friend was running to him and the lieutenant kept waving him back. And my friend kept running to him and knelt down right next to him and knelt on another landmine and blew his leg off at the hip. Oh. This was your friend. To this day. And I was in the village relaxing and having a good time. And to this day, I felt like it should have been me on patrol instead of him. But he was, it, it was just, it was the luck of the draw. Well, would, would, would you share his name, or do you? No. No. Well, well I'm sorry. That must have been very hard. He came home with a silver star and purple heart. He came home with a silver star and purple heart? Yeah, he was the first one to come home with a silver star since the end of the Korean War. Really? because he tried to save his, save his lieutenant. Well, he was a hero, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he was. So, um, so the patrol would go out, uh, uh, and these mines, had these mines been placed by whom? By, by us. By us, to, uh, Stop the North Koreans. The infiltrators. But they were still there. I wonder, though, some of them may be, still be there, I wonder. Nothing would surprise me. Right. So you had to be very, so did you have, so you must have had mine detectors, or, or was there any way to detect these things? No. During the winter, with the freeze coming, you could, you could hear the mines blowing. You could hear the blowing? Yeah. With the blowing freeze? Up. Yeah, because the, the freeze would contract the earth. Got it. So it would squeeze the... Squeeze the mines <coughs> and they'd blow up. Right. Right. Did your platoon ever um, um, actually directly encounter the someone trying to infiltrate or? 
Well, honestly, when I was there, no. I want to be honest and frank. Sure. When I was there, no. But things were really starting to heat up. Uh, and uh, we would spend so many months on the DMC, and then we would go back to our base camp, and another outfit would go up there. Another platoon? Uh, no, another division would go up there. The second oh, division would come back, and another division would go up there. And it would seem like when that other division would go up there, North Koreans would drive them crazy. Uh, was there any artillery like coming over or? Uh, no. Not, okay. No, we had artillery, but. I think you told me once that your regiment had a special name. The Manchus. The Manchus. Yeah. And that's the, I'm sorry, the 9th Regiment? The 9th Infantry Regiment, yeah. And what's the history, what's, where, where does the Manchu come from? The Manchus come from, uh, we fought in the Boxer Rebellion. Boxer Rebellion. Yeah, uh, defending the Emperor of China. Excuse me. And uh, uh, when uh, our flag, the boy who was carrying our cover, colors, he was shot and killed. And then the Italian commander picked him up and he started running with him and calling. And just as he was, being sh he was being shot and killed, he yelled, keep up the fire. And that became our, ma our motto. Keep up the fire. Keep up the fire. And to this day, uh, members of the Ninth, any Manchu, we have a special bond. Uh, we know our history. Uh, it, we're one of the founding regiments of the United States Army. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, we fought in the Indian Wars. We're a hundred soldiers fought off 2,000 Sioux Indians. Hmm. And the Sioux gave up. And uh, uh, but, uh, we, I believe uh, your hat uh, has the symbol. The or symbol. The, uh, yeah, it's emperor. a nine with a dragon wrapped around it. The man shoes. And uh, underneath the nine it says keep up the fire. Keep up the fire. Yeah. Well, sounds like a like a proud tradition. Yeah. That's great. That's great. So when you arrived in Korea uh, uh, in I guess early uh, 1968. Yeah. What was your rank uh, at the t <coughs> at the time? PFC. PFC. Yeah. And uh, so basically, so you were either at the DMZ or you were. Well, I'd go back to the base camp and uh, I'd work in the pharmacy. Okay. And. Uh, how, how how far from the DMZ was the base camp? Ah. Uh, Quite a distance. Uh, people in the history of the Korean War or the base camp is actually T Bone Hill. T Bone. T Bone. Hill. Like the steak, yeah. I, I'm rusty on my Korean War, yeah. but was that a that was a famous? Uh, yeah. And it used to be a lot taller than when we. What the hill? Yeah. What happened to it? We Blown blew away? that. We blew the hell out of it. You know, so, uh, huh. but. During the uh, Korean War. During the war. Okay. So, um, but that was our base camp. 
and uh, sometimes during the summer we would have uh, Korean civilians come to the gate and they would come up. We would have the box ambulance go down and pick a bunch up and bring them up. And I would have a translator there and I would work with the translator trying to find out what was wrong and everything else and maybe prescribe medication that was all right for them and uh, treat them and everything else. And uh, Bali would see maybe a hundred people hmm. in a day. Providing medical care to the local people? Yeah. The Koreans? Mm-hmm. And basically you were offering medical services as well to the troops who needed, yeah. came to sick call and who yeah. had whatever wrong with them and you took care of them. Yeah. Were there doctors and nurses there um, too? There was a doctor. Uh, we didn't have a nurse. Uh, we had a person where uh, his rank would be equivalent to an LPN. Licensed practical nurse? Yeah, that's what his job would be equivalent to. He wasn't an RN, but he was he was an officer. He was an enlisted man. Mm -hmm. But that's what his job would be equivalent to, an LPN. And again, you were caring for, were, but basically your responsibility was people in this recon platoon? Yeah. Right. Which is how many, uh, how many men approximately well, in the platoon? Well, there was three of us medics. But three I, medics in the platoon? Yeah. I had five men in my squad. How many? Five in my squad. Okay. So you, so you as a medic, were assigned to a squad. So there were five soldiers yeah. that were your, that you cared, had to care, take care of. Yeah. Or if the, something happened to them, you had to help them out. Yes. Did anything ever, were they, did they ever get into trouble and need, you know, special help from you? God, God bless, no, not while I was there. Thankfully. Thankfully. That's great. That's great. And so, what what were the living conditions like for you? I mean, were you living in barracks, uh, not uh, not on patrol, I'm sure. But well, in uh, when we were in the rear, we had a barrack situation. But when we were up at the DMZ, uh, we had it was like a tent type of setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he had to walk to go take a shower and everything else. But uh, yeah, so it was basically a big tent. But would the troops, say in your squad, would they like go out at night uh, on a patrol of some kind and then come back the next day? Um, uh, yeah. Patrolling, basically always on the lookout. Yeah. Or sometimes we would do a three-day where you go out and you set up ambushes at night. We claim all mines. Oh. And uh, when somebody came across, you would set up the mines and everything else. And then on, during the day, you would do it, what they call a search and destroy. And what exactly, what does that mean? I mean, I Well, you'd go searching. Searching for... You, you'd, you'd have a map and you'd have your grid and it was laid out where you would go and you'd, you'd go searching for North Koreans. Did, did, yeah, was this based on some kind of intelligence as to where, you know, was somebody feeding information as to where? That was above my pay grade. Got it. 
I, but anyway, some kind of instructions came down. Oh, yeah, yeah. Set the area, the targets, the uh, objectives. And the map grids and everything else for us to patrol. Right. Yeah. So, and then occasionally you would go back, well, you would go to base camp, but then then you were then then a whole nother division would come in after a cup uh, after I think three months and where'd you go then we w we would go back to our base camp back to the base camp okay yeah but you'd stay there for and for three months and then we'd oh. go back to the DMZ got it got it got it got it but rather than right so three months on three months off Right, because they figure you couldn't you couldn't stand three a year doing the DMZ. So you had to have a break. Yeah. And did you have, in addition to that, did you uh, have R and R or or some opportunity to get away from it all? Yeah, one time when I was back at the base camp. And I requested five days, and I went to Seoul. To Seoul? Yeah. And I visited Seoul. What was Seoul like? Uh, complete, a modern city. Right. You know, a complete opposite from the rice paddies and the rural farm cities. Because uh, even at the back of my bass camp, you would see uh, the uh, homes that the South Koreans were living in and the cows and everything else and the rice paddies there and everything. Uh, you could see all that from the base camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and so it was uh, very rural. Rural, rural right. is the word I was looking yep. for. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, but then to go to Seoul, it was a really a shocker. I mean, it was such a with the high rises and everything else. Even for a New York City boy. Uh, yeah. I, well, I mean, did it remind you at all? Spacious, New York City. spacious unit and everything else. I think it was more, you know, where I was coming from and then going back. And I, I under, I, yeah. Obviously, it was a shock relative yeah. to... But, uh, you know, I uh, stayed in a hotel for three days and went to a movie in, in Korean and... And you were, with, were you with some uh, some friends or...? Yeah, I was with, the, you know, a couple of pals, you know. and. Uh, and then I went back to base camp a little bit early. Now I think you told me that it, at some point during the time, mm, there was some change in status in terms of sort of combat pay or Oh, what, yeah, uh, uh, because when I first got there, like I said, I was 17. And I was, that's why I didn't go to Vietnam, I thought, because uh, when you're 17, you're not, we weren't allowed to be in the combat zone. Oh, you weren't? I yeah. So, uh, and we weren't receiving any combat pay or anything like that. But then I, let me see, I turned 18 in July, and uh, in August of 68, Congress made it an official combat zone. Congress made what? Korea? Yeah. Kind of all of Korea? South Korea, yeah, a combat zone. Oh, well, well, you know the DMZ, the D, the DMZ area. Yeah. So the area where you were patrolling yeah. with the recon platoon was, was a combat a, zone. Was a combat zone, and we started to receive hazardous duty pay. Right. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Because when I got there, I found it was a complete news blackout to blackout. Because, news blackout? Yeah, because I was writing my mother about what was going on there, and she said, we had, they had no idea what was going on over there. You know, nobody knew what was going on over there. So nobody back here knew what was going on. Yeah, and I tell people today that uh, 
and no offense to other veterans, I want to implicitly say, you hear about the Korean War, and you hear about the Vietnam War. But the stretch, not only the time I spent in Korea, but the years afterwards, because I went on the website and I saw, like I said, my buddy came on with the Silver Star, but there was like 10 other guys that came on with the Bronze Star in the years after I came back. And guys were coming home with the Combat Infantry Badge, medics were coming home with the Combat Medics Badges. So things got a lot worse after I left. And it's like, it's forgotten. Sometimes I ask people, do you remember the Pueblo Kuu getting captured? And people don't even remember that. You know, and it's a shame. So it sounds like you'd, you'd like people to know about this. It's, it's our history. Well, it is history. You're right. People should know. Yeah. But, but I, I guess people know what they're told to some extent, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, when they're not told anything, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to take care of it. Like I, like I implicitly said that, you know, things did not happen to me. You know, I'm not trying to take credit for anything that happened to me that I didn't do. I'm not that type of person. You know, but I'm talking about my dear friend. I know. Uh, and the guys that came in after me. Their history. Okay. Well, you're helping, their, their you're helping to correct this right their now. Their history needs to be told. I know. And you're, and, and you're helping to tell it right now on camera. That's a good thing. You know, I just feel... Well, sometimes I guess that happens and... Um, but it's, it's, it's good of you to get it on the record and have a chance to express how you feel about it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, and we appreciate you're talking about it, and certainly we appreciate your service over there Thank very you. much. So, so how long were you in Korea? One year. One year. So basically, sixty-eight. Sixty-eight, and I came back in January '69. So you rotated back and forth every three months. So you had a like six months at the DMZ and six yeah. months at base camp. <clears throat> and over that time, uh, did you, were you promoted or did you? Uh, I came home as a specialist fourth class. Specialist fourth class. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, so did you learn a lot about, I mean, you had been trained as a medic <clears throat> at Fort Sam Houston. You spent a year being a medic. What were your thoughts about being a medic? I mean, were you, did you feel like you learned a lot? And were you happy to have learned what you learned? Yes, I did. You know, I felt that this is my calling. You did? Yeah. This is what I meant, to, what I was meant so to you, do. So you really put yourself in the right spot? Yeah. Well, I know there's a long, proud tradition of medics in the military or corpsmen in the Navy or whatever they are who do wonderful things. And uh, that's great. That's great. So what do you like most about your assignment in Korea? And if nothing comes, or, or, or what did you like least? Say what I liked most was doing the uh, what we called civilian sick halls. Korean sick hall with yeah. the with the citizens. Yeah, with the villages. Hmm. And uh, what I had a hard time with the most was holidays. 
was holidays. Yeah. What? Uh, like Christmas. Oh, yes. So Christmas of 1968 was tough. It was uh because you were sort of homesick for or or no not with my home you know i i okay <laughs> all right but just uh i just i was on the dmz oh like christmas time so you yeah. weren't back in the and in the, uh you know trying to set up a little Christmas tree in the tent oh. and everything else, and it was just so phony for me. And I go, ah, you know, all this make believe stuff, and I just got so irritated. So it was hard, it was hard to kind of, yeah, get, it was hard to be in the spirit. Yeah, it was. But I guess you got to try. I, I mean, Christmas is Christmas, and but I well, was a 17 it, year old kid, too. What I was a 17 year old right. kid, too, right. Were, were were you the youngest in your? Uh, I was the oldest in my family. But in 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 your group in the service. Oh yeah, I was still a kid. You were the youngest. So did the. Uh, in right fact, the rest of my platoon were all draftees. Rest of all draftees. Yeah. All draftees, no other volunteer, no other uh, voluntary. Huh. So what was that like? I mean, did that make much difference once you were? Uh, Not to me. Not to me. So this, uh, for a 17-year-old boy, still, man, that, that must have been quite a year for you. Yeah, it was. Uh especially being out on patrol at night, you know, uh, not knowing what to expect from one minute to the other and everything else. Uh, yeah. Were you happy to finally leave uh, as a spec four? Leave Korea, that is. Leave your, leave, leave the Manchus. Yeah. Yeah, I was all right with leaving. Uh, but what surprised me is that when I landed in Seattle, and I was switching planes to go to New York. Seattle uh, and then to New York? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I was in my dress greens, my medals and ribbons. And, uh, I mean, in my cords and everything else, uh, I got spit on. You got spit on? Yeah. Which I'm sure a lot of Vietnam vets got spit on too. I don't know if a lot did, but I'm sure some did. And this was in Seat Seattle? Seattle, yeah. So, I, well, I, I, I probably don't even have to ask you what that felt like, but would you care to? Say something about it what that felt like. Everything I had in my mind and body and soul just to take my handkerchief and wipe it clean and walk away. Because I knew if I said one thing, it would be, it would get ugly. Were there a number of, did you come in on a military flight? Uh, with, yeah. In other words, full of military people. Yeah. So was this as you were getting? I was going. I was going through the airport. So I was alone. You were alone. Okay. 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 Well. So this was '68, the absolute height of the political firestorm that was happening in America, right? Yes. Were you aware of? When you were in Korea, were you, did you have any awareness of what was going on um, back in the States? Not really. Not really. So you were pretty, I mean, so, so this was a surprise, uh, a shock to you. Yeah. I mean, anytime, I mean, certainly 
anyone being getting spit on it would be a shock. But you really, it came out, out of nowhere. Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry about that. Not a way to be welcomed home. But nevertheless, you made it through the airport. You made it to your connecting flight to New York City. And was this, this, this must have been then a civilian flight? Uh, yeah, basically. It was a civilian flight, and I went to my grandmother's house. What did you, I forgot to ask, when you signed up, when you enlisted, what was the, what term, period, did you enlist for? Three years. Three? Yeah. Okay. So, um, what was next? Fort Dix, New Jersey. Fort Dix? Yeah. And I drove emergency ambulance. You dro drove an emergency ambulance at Fort, so you, just to get the chronology straight, you, <clears throat> Uh, you flew back to New York. Did you spend any oh, time had, with I your had, grandmother? I, I had 30 days leave. I well, had a month and, off. And, I had a month off. And I think you showed us a picture with your grandfather. With your grandfather. Yeah, uh, that's that's what? my mother's father. Uh, this grandmother is my father's mother. Okay. So different. But the picture of you and your grandfather was, was was it at that time or? No, that grandfather died, uh, maybe a few years. Ago. But uh, yeah, he was still alive when I came home. Okay. 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 So you spent some time at home, and Fort Dix is in New Jersey, so you didn't have far to go. No, I just hop a bus and go home whenever I wanted to. So you, t what was it like in New York City, by the way? Uh, speaking of political uh, situation. Well, you know, I never wore my uniform anywhere, really. Uh, was that because you just didn't want to? Yeah. Be part of the. And uh, a cousin of mine. It was part of a group that uh, had a servicemen's club. Servicemen's club? Yeah, where we could go and with other GIs and, uh, you know, have coffee and soda and they would supply everything. And every once in a while they'd have a band come in, we'd have dances and everything else. They would. They were to have ladies, you know, be there as hostesses too. So. Uh, so that was a good place to go. Yeah, it was, and. Uh, uh, but when I got to New Jersey, Fort Dix, I, I was thinking to myself, I am not an ambulance driver. <laughs> I'm a combat medic. You're mm -hmm. a combat medic, not an ambulance driver. Yeah, and I asked to go back to Korea, and they said, no, you can't go back unless you've been home a year. Oh. I said, oh, my God. So you really, if they'd said yes, you would have gone right back? Yeah, I would have. Rather they, than be an ambulance driver yeah. at Fort Dix, New Jersey. Because they asked me why I wanted to go back. I said, I wanted to go back to support my platoon. to support my company. Right. And, uh, but they said, no, you have to be home. When you're in combat, when you come home, you have to be home for a year before you can go back. So I was at Dick's for about a year, and then I got transferred to Fort Evans. So what, what was it like, by the way? So this was an ambulance driver on the base? Uh, well, there was three ambulances. Uh, one ambulance would just, if somebody on base got sick or hurt, they would go to that person. Uh, one would uh, transport patients from the hospital to other hospitals off base. 
and uh, the other ambulance would be held in reserve in case another emergency cropped up all of the other ambulances are out. And uh, so a lot of times we were just sitting around. I mean, it was, oh, I hated it. So that, that wasn't a rewarding uh, post? No, no. For you? No, it wasn't. I mean, and you were still a spec, you were a spec four? Yeah. And so finally you, after a year, you say? Yeah. You got a transfer to Fort, Devons? Fort Devons? Fort Devons, yeah. Massachusetts. And, yeah, and when I first got there, uh, the head sergeant of the hospital said he was looking for a volunteer for an assignment. Uh, he needs somebody to work the female pediatrics ward. The, the pediatric ward? The female. Female. Pediatrics ward. And uh, he said, you will not be mopping floors or things like moving beds and things like that. You'll be working basically with the pedis, with the, with the children and the babies. Is this like newborns? Uh, uh, or if they may be, or you know, a little bit older than that, or we would get uh, two, three, four, five year olds, and uh, I raised my hand. That sounded good to you. Yeah, and I did. And uh, when I got to the ward, uh, the head nurse, Major Costello, God bless you. Uh, she expressed the same feeling. She said, you're not gonna be here just to mop floors and move beds and things like that or transport people. Uh, went to the front of the ward where the PDs were kept and said, these are your kids, okay. And uh, so I took care of them and everything else. So you took care of the, the young children? Yeah. Like giving them medicine or? Uh, I would give, well, I couldn't give them medicine because I wasn't a nurse. A nurse has to give medicine. Oh, okay. But uh, feeding. Feeding them. Feeding them, changing them, washing them, you know. Taking sure, care of them. Making sure the beds are changed or clean or whatever. Yeah, making sure they were happy. Happy. Yeah, I enjoy that thoroughly. And then uh, I got, I took a little bit of leave time, about two weeks leave I took personal leave. And then when I came back, I was told by the uh, head sergeant of the hospital that I was being transferred, that I now was gonna run the uh, emergency room 11 to seven. The emergency room? 11 to 7, 11 at night till 7 in oh. the morning. So you were running the emergency room? Yeah. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, I was in charge. Uh, anybody came in, I would determine what was wrong, you know, what they needed, things like that, uh, making sure they got the proper treatment. Because uh, we had doctors there, but back then, a person that was in medical school and they were in their last year of residency, they could enlist. And when they enlisted, they became an officer. Okay. So we had to call them doctor. And, uh, but at the ER, he'd be in his room at night sleeping. And he did not want to be woken unless heart attack, bleeding to death, something of that major catastrophe. A life-threatening situation. Yeah. Other than that, it was my responsibility to so see. So you basically it. had to 
had to yeah, treat, I, I, treat had, I had about t two people working with me. Both medics? Yeah. Other medics? Mm hmm And they worked under me, yeah. And this was at Devon's, which at the time was probably a pretty busy place. Yeah, the 82nd Airborne was there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it was still a busy place, yeah. So how did you like that assignment? I loved it. I mean, you were in charge and a lot to do. Yeah, I loved it. And I did that until I got out. Big responsibility, huge, right? Mm -hmm. I loved it. I did that until I got out in uh, September 1970. So September 70. So 68 was Korea, 69 was or so was Fort Dix, and 70 was uh, Fort Devens. And September 70 was when you was discharged. Was discharged. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's. You had varied uh, duties, and I guess, uh, with the exception of the Fort Dix, it sounds like you were happy doing what you were doing. Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. And you left as a Spec Four. Yeah. So you were, you were. Um, let's see. Let me just. Uh, so, you were discharged. Where? At Fort Devens. At Fort Devens. Yeah, and what decorations had you, uh, or had you received decorations? Um, well, there's the National Defense Medal that everybody gets when they enlist. And then when I was in Korea, I was awarded the uh, National Expeditionary Medal. The Expeditionary? Yeah. Okay. And uh, the Korean Defense Service Medal. Korean Defense Service Medal. Okay, and I believe we have a display of your medals, which will be incorporated in this uh, interview. So, okay. well, congratulations on those. Thank you. What were your feelings? So, you were discharged at Devons. Now, did you go to Lemonster from there? Yeah, I stayed in Lemonster. Yeah, I lived in Lemonster. I went right to Lemonster. How did you happen to pick Lemonster? I mean, it's close by. Yeah, I met a woman, and uh, she ended up being my wife. And okay, and that brought you to Lemonster. Yeah. And uh, so what were your feelings uh, when you walked out the door, so to speak, uh, from, your ser from your service? Were you... Uh, uh, were you glad to be done? Or were you a little, uh, did, did, did you have good feelings about your service time? Yeah, and uh, I, I was uh, 20 years old and I just, I was done. It was time to go. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. What was the political climate like at the time? When you left in September of 70, things had calmed down, I would guess, some or a lot from 68? Uh, a little bit, not much. Uh, I forget who was president at that time. But, uh, May have been, was it Johnson? N Nixon. Nixon, I'm sorry, Nixon. It was yeah, Nixon. so... Um, but Johnson was gone, thank God, because he was the one really building up Vietnam. Uh, so. But in terms of the scene, like in Lemonster, I mean, was there much? Uh, <clears throat> of course, by then, most U.S. well, U.S. troops were being pulled out of Vietnam. Yeah. Um, so maybe things were a little less hot. Yeah, and in Lemonster, there was no real. Uh, uh, political uproar in Lemonster it was, it was real more like, I would call it a country town. 
country. People, right. people from Lemonster probably wouldn't call that. You know, they still call it a city. <laughs> but being from New York, I call it a country town. So, okay. Um, okay. So things were pretty, uh, sounds like a comfortable place for you to be. Yeah. And obviously it is. it has been because you've lived there ever since until you came here. Yeah. So when you came home, did you discuss much about your service time with your spouse or friends or family or really anybody? No, not really. Uh, Because I remember when I got home from Korea, I was at my mother's apartment and I was laying on the couch, couch and I was sleeping and she came over to me and shook me to wake me up. Oh. And I don't know what I did, but when I opened my eyes, she was standing about four feet away from me with eyes like silver dollars. This was your mother? Your My mother. Your mother. Yeah. And after that, she would stand at the door. If I was sleeping, she would stand at the door and call, yell at me. She would never come near me again if I was sleeping. Because so, of shaking you? I don't know what I did, but it must have been something. To this day, I don't like to be touched when I'm sleeping. Wow. I jump. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. To this day. Wow. So you came to, did you join the reserves or any? Uh, yes. A few, a few years later, I joined the reserves <clears throat> as a medic. I did a year. A year? Yeah. In the reserve? Yeah, as a medic. And uh, did you consider uh, being in the reserve longer or? Um, <clears throat> yeah, but it just got to be between that, my job, and everything else, it just got to be too complicated. And what were you doing at the time? What was your uh, job? I was working uh, with a firm that manufactured computer disks. Computer disks? Yeah. Ah. And we built the, the machines that manufactured the just. Oh, I see. Yeah. So did, did and you? And I inspected those machines. The machines? Yeah, I inspected them. I had to know lasers, optics, the whole nine yards, uh, computer programming. and. This was early days of computing, oh, right? Yeah. Did you have any, uh, did you continue in any way your medical work? Well, when I got out of the Army, I tried going to my local hospital, but all I can get a job is an orderly. And, orderly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, uh, when I would start my shift through 11, I would get my patient list and my patient care, and I would do them. But then after I had done my basic care and the other female aides did their patient care, they would go in the break room and break out their knitting, and I would go to the nurse station and I would have a list of surgical preps to do for the next day, huh. uh, traction setups to do for the next day, Inhalation therapy they just have to do. And I was getting paid the same money that the. And you were doing all the work, basically. And uh, after about a year or two, I said, enough of this. You know. So that's, is that when you. Because I tried switching hospitals and everything else. I went to work in the hospital in Fitchburg, which is right, the city right next door. And, you know, 
walking through 11, and there was another male aide there, and we did the same thing, uh, catheterizations, surgical preps, and everything else. Uh, I was making a little bit more, but uh, I don't know. I guess the passion went out of me. Yep. Uh, so uh, I just stopped. And back then I was drinking way, 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 way too much. Uh, I started drinking before I went in the Army, and I drank all the time I was in the Army. And uh, drinking was a big part of most of my life. Is that right? Yeah. So you had a drinking problem? Yeah. Drinking and some drugs mixed in. You know. Drinking and some drugs? Yeah. You know, well, at least now, uh, this coming March 3rd, God willing, I have 34 years of sobriety. Wow. Congratulations for that. That's a tremendous accomplishment. Couldn't have done it without God. Because Lord knows I didn't want to do it. You know. But you decided to do it, and you stuck with it? Yeah. One day at a time. Uh, and I tell people that I try and help sometimes that. Sometimes that's too much. I got to do it moment by moment. Even a day is too much? Yeah. Yes, yes. Because I got to go through the morning, then through the afternoon, yep. and then through the evening, and everything else. You know, I got to get through this moment here and now. So you. You set the obje objective as, as realistically as? As realistically as I can, yeah. You've done it, but I know you have to keep doing it. Yeah. It doesn't stop. That's why, you know, I tell people I'm an alcoholic and I have 30, I'll have 34 years of sobriety. And they say, well, you're not an alcoholic anymore. You're sober. I said, no, no, no. Or they say, you're recovered. I said, no, no. All it takes is one drink. And I'm not only back where I was, I'm like, I, I never stopped 34 years ago. Because I got sober after two suicide attempts. After what? Two suicide attempts. I see. okay. And uh, so when I went into treatment, they had me see the psychiatrist and he told me that it's not going to be easy. But if I pick up a drink again, it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse in a hurry. And I remember that saying right to this day. You're very courageous. I do the best I can with what I got. That's all any of us can do. Day by day. Good for you. Thank you. Good for you. Did you join any veterans organization or the American Legion, that, that kind of thing? No, I didn't. Okay. I am a, I did become a lifetime member of the DAV, but I never received Of the any. Disabled American Veterans. Yeah. Uh, I, when I was down in West Roxbury, I went to their office and I, gave them the money to be a lifetime member, but I never received any literature or anything else from them. Well, good for you. You're entitled. Um, you ever, have you ever been in contact uh, with any of the folks that you served with? No. With the Manchus, but I know you told me you occasionally will run into yeah. a Manchu who you're, I run into you're, you're a couple. You're united in that sense. I run into a couple that work here. Work here. Yeah, and uh, they notice my hat, <laughs> and they smile, 
One calls me Mr. Manchu. <laughs> and uh, another fellow works here. He looked at it, he smiled, and he told me he was with the ninth. And we, we, people in the ninth, we have a, a bond. When you join the ninth, uh, it's not like joining another regiment. Uh, like I was saying, it's the, one of the oldest regiments in the United States Army. It's one of the most decorated regiments in the United States Army. Uh, when I got there, I found a, we were the only regiment in the United States Army that were allowed to wear a special belt buckle. It was this crest. Hmm on the belt buckle. On the buckle. Instead of a plain bass brass. You mean it's part of your uniform? Yeah, it's part of our uniform, the wear daily. And uh, uh, and when you would be walking and you would meet an officer, instead of saluting them and giving them the greeting of the day, like good morning, sir, good afternoon, sir, good evening, sir. Uh, you would always say, keep up, the, salute and say, keep up the fire. That's our motto. That's your motto and that's what you said. And we say, keep up the fire. Keep up the fire. And you kept up the fire. I do my best. I love your hat. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, do you remember your service number? My service number is RA11825608. I guess you do remember your service number. Good for you. <laughs> I remember mine. I, I, uh, uh, it's hard to forget, isn't it? Oh, with that drill sergeant beating down your neck, you don't <laughs> forget that. They switched from service numbers to social security numbers when I was in about six months. And they went to just the social security numbers. But still, uh -uh. you don't really forget your service number. Uh -uh. Well, it sounds like it's pretty well imprinted on your uh, brain. Oh, yeah. Good. Well, now it's recorded uh, forever. <laughs> And if my drill sergeant is watching by some imagination, Sergeant Your drill Hart. sergeant. What was his name? Sergeant Hart. Hart? Yeah, H-A-R-T. Sounds like he made an impression on you. God bless you, Sergeant. You did a wonderful job. So now for a few reflections on your part. Um. How important to you was your service, your three years of service, as you look back on it? Part of my life. Part of your life. It formed you at a very early age, didn't it? Yeah. It's, you know, I tell people, I don't regret one single day of my life, the good, the bad, or the ugly. You take any of it out, and I'm not who I am. My three years in the Army make up part of who I am. Right. <clears throat> I embrace it. Some of it's hard for me, but still, it makes up who I am. Well, you went in at the age of 17 and came out at the age of 20. Yeah. So those are pretty special years. I should have been still playing stickball on the streets in New York City. You could have been. But you chose another path. Do you feel that your service, that your time in the service affected the rest of your life or affected your life? In some ways, yeah. Hmm? In some ways, yes. Uh, I'll 
was at Jamaica playing the beginning of my sobriety and uh, uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Uh, <clears throat> my problem is my mind's like a video camera. It records everything, and I can't block it out. There's no way for me to hit the erase button. So it, it, it plays, whether you want it to or not. Yeah. Well, you found a way to deal with that. I guess. Looking back on it all, do you, can you think of a particularly memorable experience or memorable character or something humorous? Anything that just, you know, kind of comes to mind? Something that happened to you or, uh, uh, or a person you met? I guess your drill sergeant. My drill sergeant and also when I went to Fort Devens, my uh, went on the, went on the female pediatric ward, Major Costello, the nur uh, the she, charge nurse, the charge nurse. Yeah, she had a big impression on me. You know, she was fantastic. Made sure that I had all I need. That nobody tried to uh, make me do this or that or that. She. Uh, treated me with respect and uh, yeah, like I said, I, I can see her today. Can you? In my mind, yeah. I can see that ward. Like I said, my mind's like a video camera. Got I it right, see, right there playing. I can see the ward. <clears throat> when you went on the ward, the, the PDs were, her office was here. And the PDs were there, and then the, in rooms, and then the woman were on the ward in the back. Major Costello. Yes. Well, uh, one of the reasons you remember her is because uh, you were special to her. She saw something in you. And you delivered for her, I'm sure. I tried to do my best. I know you did. Um, is there anything, anything else, any thought, anything I haven't asked you um, mm, that you'd like to share with uh, the camera? Well, one thing I just in closing, what I'd like to say is if any members of the 9th Infantry Regiment are watching, just in closing, I'd like to say, keep up the fire, brothers. Keep up the fire. Thank you. And on that note, I say thank you, Kevin Barry Strell, for this great interview. It's been a real pleasure and honor to talk to you. Thank you and thank you for your service. Thank you for asking me.